I drove over 1,800 miles on a 10-day road trip through four states to get here. And here. Two of the few remaining darkest skies in the United States. You see, my city has grown so bright that I can no longer see the Milky Way, and it got me thinking about what the night sky might have looked like hundreds or thousands of years ago. And so you and I, this telescope, are going on a trip together. Hi! And the family. The family's coming too. We'll be traveling through California, Nevada, Idaho, Utah, a little bit of Arizona, and then back to California. And along the way, we're going to stop at two locations. I'm gonna share with you the different tools and techniques that I used to plan this trip so that you can plan your own dark sky trip if you want. So grab your bags because we're going on an epic adventure together. So first we have to pick a dark sky location, lightpollutionmap.info. If you live on the right side of the United States, I'm sorry, there's not a whole lot of options for you. Let's talk about how this map works really quick. When you click on a location, it will tell you the Bortle rating for that site. So the way the Bortle scale works, it's a range from one being the darkest skies possible to nine being like the Las Vegas Strip. Joshua Tree National Park is kind of known around here as being the premier dark sky location. But you can see that even it is influenced by the light dome of Riverside County over here. So let's go ahead and look at this place. If I click here, I can see that really the darkest area that I can get to and still be on a, a paved road is Bortle Class 3. That's much better than my backyard, but still, that's as good as we can get, getting pretty close to Arizona and Nevada. Then we can get some truly dark skies, Bortle Class 2. Now, my wife's sister lives in Idaho, and they just had a baby. So it was a perfect opportunity to take a road trip up to Idaho and see the new baby and, and see her sister again. So I started thinking about Idaho, and my understanding is that much of it is pretty rural. And so I thought, perhaps there might be some good dark skies. Twin Falls is where we'll be going. But there's this preserve called the Craters of the Moon National Monument. And look at this, Bortle Class 1. These are the darkest skies you can find. And it's only about two hours from Twin Falls. So if you're gonna drive all the way to Twin Falls, you might as well drive another two hours. So Craters of the Moon is where I'm gonna be going. Now that we know where the dark skies are, we're going to use Google Maps with the satellite view overlay to pick an exact location where to set up. Maps.google.com. Let's go first to Idaho. Craters of the Moon National Monument. In the lower left-hand corner, you can select different layers. Now you want to be careful in locations like this because some of these roads might not actually be paved. They might be dirt roads. I wanted to try to stay on a paved road because I didn't want all the dust and stuff to get all over my lenses and cameras and everything. Here I can see that there is a campground here, and I'm not sure I want to be in a campground because other campers might have lights on. So let's see if we can find another location. If we switch to the satellite view, we can see that some of these trailheads have parking lots. That might be a perfect place to set up. The Devil's Orchard Nature National Recreation Trail has a, a nice parking lot and it even has a little vault toilet in case nature calls. That's always a nice thing to have. Now looking at a satellite view is one thing, but I'm gonna use the Google Street View to really get a close up look at what this place looks like. To do that, you just drag this little person icon and drop it onto any of these blue lines. Here's the little bathroom facility. This is what the view of the northern sky looks like. It looks like there's even some tables out here where we that we could use to set up our gear. This is what the view of the southern sky looks like. So some of the things that you're going to want to look for on this is um, trees and mountains. Where is your target? Is it low on the horizon? Make sure there's no mountains that are going to obscure that view. This looks like it's going to be a pretty good location. So let's go ahead and call the visitor center, talk to a ranger, and see if they'll let us set set up here. A quick Google search should give us the phone number. There it is. Let's give them a call. Well, that'd be perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Cool.
they said I could do it as long as I don't fall asleep and as long as I don't set up any tents or anything. They, they say that I can set things up, so it looks like we've chosen a good location. Idaho isn't the only place we'll be going. On the way back, we're going to spend a few days in Zion National Park. So I performed the same Google Maps reconnaissance to find a few possible setup locations there. Zion isn't like Craters of the Moon. There's only one road accessible to private vehicles, and there aren't any parking lots that you can set up in along the way. Most of the hiking takes place along a second road, only accessible via shuttle bus, and dragging all my gear on a bus just wasn't an option. So I found an observation point in Kolob Canyon on the northwest side of the park that the rangers said I could use, again as long as I stayed awake and didn't set up a camp. I also found a road on the southwestern side of the park that cuts through the lower part of Kolob Canyon. It's not as dark, but it is accessible and closer to our hotel, making a good backup location. And at Bortle 2, it's still one of the darkest places in the United States. By the way, if you're curious how I've been adding these little stars and pins on my map, it's a good trick to know. When you add the pins to your desktop map, they'll also show up in the Google Maps app on your phone, making it easier to find where you wanted to go later. So here's how you do it. Uh, zoom into wherever you want to put a pin, and then click wherever you want to do it. Down here at the bottom, you'll see uh, the coordinates of that location. Click on the coordinates, and then you have a little save option right here. When you click on that, you can uh, mark it as a place you want to go, or I like to use the starred places as places I've already been. So I'm all packed up and I wanna show you something. So this, this one bag is all the family stuff. That's all of their stuff. And all of the rest of this, it's all my stuff. So I've got all the telescope stuff here, but most of it is all the video stuff I need to, to shoot this video. So I'm bringing all this junk, hauling it across the country. Doing it for you guys. Are you guys ready for our road trip? Yeah. Yes. All right, let's go. The first leg of the trip had us leaving our home in Southern California and passing through Las Vegas, Nevada. Las Vegas has some of the most light blue skies in the U.S., so we'll be taking in the sights from the freeway as we pass right on through today. We're headed for our first stop seven and a half hours away, the La Quinta Inn in Ely, Nevada, where we'll spend one night before continuing the rest of the way to Twin Falls, Idaho. With a population of just over 4,000 and an elevation of 6,400 feet, this small community in central Nevada is nestled in the heart of the Great Basin. This former mining boom town is now a charming pit stop on our dark sky adventure. Ely got its start in the late 1800s as a stagecoach station, but it hit the jackpot when copper was discovered. By the early 1900s, this little town was booming, even earning the nickname Nevada's Copper Queen. Was that pretty good pizza? Yes. Why, wow, you like it? Yes. All right. We ate at the Hometown Pizza in Ely, Nevada, and it is uh, pretty good for pizza made in a small town, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Pretty tasty. Our hotel was comfortable and clean, although we had some trouble getting the key cards to work consistently. We only stay at hotels with breakfast, and this one did not disappoint. The next morning had us back on the road for another four hours. Are you having fun? Yeah. <laughs> we found a beautiful home near Twin Falls on Verbo to rent for the four days we were here. Having access to a kitchen and laundry machines was a real help. We spent some time with Yvonne's sister and the new baby. He's super cute, by the way. Twin Falls, Idaho is perched on the rim of the mighty Snake River with a population of around 53,000 and a whole lot of scenic drama to go with it. While you're here, you can't miss the Perim Bridge, one of the highest in the U.S. at 486 feet above the Snake River. It's not just for show. This is one of the only legal base jumping spots in the country open year round. You might even catch someone leaping off of it while you're still trying to process the view. Right next to the bridge, the Twin Falls Visitor Center is more than just a brochure stop. It's got jaw-dropping canyon views, historical displays, and all manner of souvenirs. Did you get a new friend? Yes. <laughs> 
can't come to Twin Falls without a trip to Idaho Joe's. Idaho Joe's was our favorite dining spot. In fact, we made it a point to eat lunch here every day. The portions are as generous as the people. And the homemade pies. Oh, the homemade pies. What do you think of those Idaho potato french fries? <laughs> and of course, no visit to Twin Falls is complete without a visit to the majestic Shoshone Falls. Often called the Niagara of the West, at 212 feet, it's actually taller than Niagara Falls. It's especially impressive during the spring runoff when it roars with snowmelt. Need a break from the nature overload? The Magic Valley Mall has you covered with all the essentials, clothes, snacks, and even an indoor play area for the kids. On the Google Maps, I found Niagara Springs. Apparently off most people's radar, we were the only ones here. A stunningly clear, icy spring that gushes straight out of the canyon walls and into the Snake River. It's part of the Thousand Springs Scenic Byway. I can't tell you how weird it was to see this much water shooting straight out of solid rock. Absolutely amazing. Twin Falls is more than just a stopover. It's a mashup of natural wonder, small town charm, and unexpected thrills. Whether you're here for the falls, the food, or just to stretch your legs before your next dark sky destination, this town definitely makes an impression. It was on our second day here during the new moon that I took the two hour drive northeast to Craters of the Moon National Monument. This volcanic wonderland was shaped by repeated eruptions from the Great Rift, a series of deep cracks in the Earth's crust. Some flows here are as young as 2,000 years. Geologically speaking, that's pretty recent. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge designated it a national monument, calling it a weird and scenic landscape peculiar to itself. And he wasn't kidding. Today, you can hike over jagged lava, climb extinct cinder cones, and even descend into lava tubes, which are underground tunnels once filled with molten rock. It's a surreal mix of science, silence, and natural beauty. But we're not here for the rocks. We're here for the Bortle One sky. Growing up in Southern California, I've never seen the sky like this. Cameras always make the Milky Way look more amazing than what you see in person because they can capture more light than your eye, and post-processing enhances the colors. But let me show you something. This image is completely unedited, straight out of the camera. If I dial back the exposure just a touch, this is pretty close to what it actually looked like with the naked eye. But notice the light pollution on the horizon. Isn't this supposed to be Bortle 1? The Bortle scale measures sky quality at the zenith, that's straight overhead. So it's common for dark sky sites to still have light pollution in the direction of distant cities as far away as 100 miles or more. In this case, Burley, about 64 miles south, and Pocotillo, 68 miles southeast. So what gives this sky a class one rating? Here are some things to look out for. Does the light from the Milky Way cast shadows? This untracked image at ISO 6400 reveals that it does. And these shadows were visible to the naked eye. Remember, this is a moonless night. Looking closer to the zenith, air glow is clearly visible in this unedited image and to the naked eye. Air glow happens when molecules in the atmosphere about 80 to 100 kilometers up get excited. It often appears as wavy bands, curtains, or arcs in long exposure astrophotos. I originally mistook these glowing green bands as clouds, but notice their uniform transparency as stars are clearly visible through them. These bands also moved very slowly, much more slowly than clouds in the troposphere would have moved. This sky was an emotionally moving experience. I saw more shooting stars on this regular night than I ever do during meteor showers back at home. I think if everyone could experience this, there would be more incentive to protect the night sky. This is what our ancestors saw hundreds and thousands of years ago. I wanted a target that I couldn't shoot from home and the shark nebula seemed to fit the bill. This is a dark nebula, and you need a dark sky to shoot it. It emits no light, just some extremely faint reflections from surrounding stars. 
I'll be shooting it in LRGB with my new ASI 2600mm Air. My research indicated that I wouldn't be able to see anything until after I got home and started processing, but the sky was so dark, a three minute sub at f3.9 was all it took to reveal its ghostly silhouette. At this latitude, the nights are extremely short, so I only had three hours of true darkness to get the drop done. This is the result. Maybe not as colorful as the Orion Nebula, or as spectacular as the elephant's trunk with the Hubble palette, but this, this is a shot I couldn't get from home. It would have sank into the abyss of Southern California light pollution. The contrast between the ghostly reflection of cosmic dust illuminated by starlight against the backdrop of this Bortle One black sky, it takes on new meaning when you understand what you're seeing, and even more when you recognize the difficulty in seeing it at all. This may be one of my favorite captures to date. But our trip's not over yet. We still have to visit the Bortle Two skies of Zion National Park in Utah but that's gonna have to be a story for another day. So make sure you subscribe and ring the bell so you're notified when our dark sky adventure continues. Until then, wishing you clear skies.